What a pleasure to be here que prazer estar aqui no Brasil. Such a beautiful country. É um país tão bonito. And as a matter of fact, yesterday e, coming aliás, here, ontem, quando eu vinha chegando, the airplane was empty. O, o, o and someone else looked vazio. at me and said to me, uh, what is someone disse, from the United States o que será coming que to Brazil on Thanksgiving? I had to explain to them that, although I live in the United States, I'm eu actually eu from Canada, so Unidos, I'm very thankful, and my Thanksgiving is to come to this beautiful country e and enjoy uh, your company here today. So many thanks aqui to para o Brasil for inviting eu Cisco eu aqui nesse uh, to seu speak at this event. It's, Portanto, it's very much an honor. Of course, coming through the uh, world's, one of the world's aqui. largest cities, and the changes that are taking place. I'm enjoying my 25th visit to maiores. Brazil. Ah, pela the future. Vez no Brasil. If only ah, we knew the future. Se nós In fact, if we knew the future of the stock market, maybe we wouldn't even have to be here today and we could uh, Talvez a gente não just dream about the beach. Tá there is nothing like a dream. Não há nada como and um sonho. Perhaps 10 years ago, e many of us had never even heard of Cisco Systems, nós nunca and yet today Cisco Systems, Cisco which had a dream, existiria. is now the world's second most valuable corporation. Um In the networking sonho. industry, Cisco is famous for having done a breakaway. And in fact, in the early 90s, there were many companies in this industry who all had the chance. The Várias internet was at the backs of many companies, whether it was ACC, NSC, Digital empresas, Equipment, ACC, IBM, Hewlett Packard, Wellfleet, Synoptics. Many of these companies had this chance, and yet there was one company that broke away. Well, will this happen in the telecommunications industry? Well, it may come as no surprise to you that Cisco sees a future uh, in the telecommunications industry. We've seen our business volumes adjust to where over 50% of our business in Latin America comes from service providers. Interestingly, this kind of breakaway has happened very much for us in Brazil. It's uh, unbelievable when I see the numbers coming. Now, thank you certainly to privatization, deregulation, and the uh, expansion of the economy here in Brazil. For the second year in a row, we are seeing our business double. Last year, we were up over 130%. Brazil was in the top five growth countries for Cisco worldwide. Well, the future is something that people in New York, Wall Street, are paid to analyze. And one of the forms of analysis is they recommend whether to buy or sell a company's stock. The result, of course, ends up in what's called market capitalization. Now, maybe this is an accurate way of looking at the future. Maybe it isn't, but for sure, the market capitalization put on Cisco says that the world does believe that data communications and the use of packets and IP will make a tremendous difference. What I'm showing here is the market value on your left side of companies that are traditional data companies. You'll see that many of them are zero, and that's because many of them have gone away, either through acquisition or going out of business. But on your right side is the market capitalization of companies you're very familiar with. In fact, those are the top eight companies in the, in the telecommunications industry, and you can see that the market value of those companies, if you even added three of them together, does not uh, meet up with what the expectations of the market are for Cisco. Well, why is this important? Well, because this industry is moving so quickly that market value turns out also to be your currency. And in its short history, Cisco has acquired 68 companies primarily through the use of its currency or its market capitalization. I don't have to show people in this room how fast things are changing. In just six years, we went from a world where the internet was just in certain countries to where virtually the entire world is covered with the, the internet. This ubiquity is changing the way everything happens. Now, we understand, of course, that if you look at the use of the internet, that in countries like the United States, that about 50% of people are regular users of the internet. Now, that compares with Brazil, perhaps in the 5% range, but there's no question we can all see where things are going. When we look at the number of users, 
quando olhamos uh, o número de usuários. A predição é que isso vai continuar, onde, em alguns anos, haverá mais de um bilhão de usuários mundiais na internet. O número de conteúdo que está disponível continua a crescer. O e-commerce. Notice how we've broken it into B to C, business to consumer and business to business. Cisco today is the world's largest e-commerce company, setting the pace for how business can be done. But we also think that the explosion of internet-based technology is going to come from another area that's relatively unseen, and that is, is that corporations and countries use internet technology, the cost savings compared with traditional ways of doing things are immense. You've seen these kinds of charts that are happening everywhere. So companies like AT&T point out that IP traffic is now exceeding that of all other types of traffic. WorldCom, in their annual report, continues to point out that voice will be less than 50% of their revenues by the end of this year. They predicted this at the beginning of the year. The challenge, of course, as we see also this happening in Brazil, even though we are deploying way more telephone telephones in this country, we're still seeing a growth rate on data that far exceeds voice, a growth rate of over 60% for data. So how does that impact spending? Well, all the vendors are looking very carefully at this. We've seen some tremendous drop in value in companies because of what's being looked at for CapEx. So cap spending, capital spending is being held flat or in certain cases even reducing. Well, what we're seeing is a distribution where the traditional circuit business, the investment is moving towards packets. So I'll point out here seven different areas that we see the changes happening in and how we're positioning our company uh, in these seven areas. Four are in hardware and three are in software. The first is the demand for bandwidth. This is what's driving optical. This is what's driving broadband access. It's a place where your vendors have to be. The statistics continue to show how mobility is going to change everything. So whether it's a PDA or a cell phone, that kind of access to the internet is going to expand its usefulness. And now that there are two cell phones for every three landlines here in Brazil, the wireless internet becomes very important. The revolution in price performance applies in, in most areas at a rate unprecedented in telecoms. If we look at IP, where we see the time to double performance only 20 months, wave division multiplexing in the optics only 10 months and price performance doubles. As we move towards lowering cost of processing, the siliconization will increase performance capability. We all know that these trends, which also apply to the applying of intelligence to the network, create tremendous pressures on our industry. Because if costs go down by 50%, we have to increase usage by more than 50% just to hold our own. So taking intelligence to the network in content and in the devices is where we see tremendous opportunity. So it's not just the PC web anymore, but it's all the different forms of access to the web that are going to require the network to be more intelligent. So our move is towards content-aware networks, where we look at the delivery and understand what kind of performance we have in the network. We, the network becomes, rather than just a transport mechanism, the network becomes more content-aware, so that your network would know where the information is that the user is asking for. We also end up with much higher performance switching so that the bottlenecks are no longer the routers and the switches in the network. Intelligence also involves caching, where content is anticipated by the network and located closer to the user. But tying all this together, once again in software, is the ability for, to have virtual private networks. We envision a world where when, no matter where you travel, you will have broadband access. If you're in your own office, of course, we're now used to high-speed performance with our personal computers. But what happens when you're at an airport? What happens when you're at someone else's office? What happens when you're at home? So our need to have the security of 
virtual private networks and high performance so that no matter where you are, the behavior is the same as if you're in your own office. So whether it applies to intranets, which has been the traditional way where companies have connected local area networks, how we have access from the home, but also the way we tie in our suppliers and our customers to VPNs. So the value chain, in terms of the uh, OSI model, says to you, can you make money if you just stay in layer two, layer three? Or do you mean, or can you possibly move up? Moving up is where we see all the service providers throughout the world focusing their attention. How do we get closer to the application that the user is, is working on? So the application hosting services where you can provide extra value means that you must get closer to what the customer is doing, understanding the content. So at this point, I'd like to describe a little bit about what we're talking about with New World Connections. Use of internet technology changes the way business is run. Every business relationship, particularly external interactions, change. So a company has to look not just how they interact with their employees using the technology, but also their suppliers, their customers, and their partners. Our company believes that the service providers are the key to this, and they're the natural partners for providing these con connections. So what our mission at this point, uh, Cisco who grew up with enterprise companies, is how do we change the technology let me give you some examples of how we see this changing. Customer service, for example, traditionally has required someone to call in, ask for information. The person who answers the phone, uh, not unusually, looks into the database and gives back an answer. So most customer service phone calls require this intermediary. What we see happening is, is that internet customer service connects the user to the data. So let's take our company, for example. Cisco now is the world's largest e-commerce company with over 90% of our orders done electronically. Uh, with a $25 billion run rate, 90% means we're doing in excess of $20 billion of, of internet ordering. But we extend it even further than that, and that is that we give customers the ability to support themselves. Supporting themselves means they have access to the data that is in our service database. By being able to handle over 75% of the support calls, customers get faster response, solve problems more quickly, and when we ask them about their satisfaction, we've seen an increase in satisfaction of 3.4 on a scale of 5 to over 4.25. Other applications that start to demonstrate how customer support for, as an example application, brings the world of telephony and the world of IT so much closer together would be in this particular case. So you're on the screen, you're looking for help, and you're using the web browser. By click to talk, the person at the other end of the of the telephone at the supplier knows who to call and you'll be on the phone and at the web browser at the same time. But then further technology allows the support rep to actually link to your personal computer and take control of your browser with your permission, of course. That technology which is available today allows the support rep to guide the customer through so that they can be more involved with self-help. The same type of technology applies to supply chain management. Once an order has been placed, by connecting the suppliers through electronics, through the network, we end up being able to handle everything uh, using internet technology more productively. In Cisco's case, from the moment that a customer places the order electronically, over 50% of the products are never even touched by Cisco hands. So the, this has enabled us to do virtual manufacturing. It allows us to get products out more quickly at great at lower cost. So in summary, what we see the need to do for service providers is to move up the value chain. So while we talk about core transport, there's no question that it becomes very difficult to make money in these areas. Access services as well. Can you make money on just access services? So virtual private networks, 
também, something we call unified messaging, where that connects the voicemail and email and other types of applications together in one platform. So content delivery, web hosting, uh, integrated customer service, and of course, uh, getting closer to the customer's application. So the focus in Cisco Systems is on next generation network technology. We're very fortunate as a company that we've been able to uh, diversify our business model. There are now 44 business units within Cisco Systems focusing on 25 different technology areas. Out of those 25 technology families, there's 12 of them that are generating over $1 billion in business per year. So that kind of diversity gives us a certain amount of, uh, of less risk as far as running our business. But we take our business and we're focusing on five different areas that we believe will lead us to continued growth and to help be where the market's going to be. The first and the most important for us is the integration of data, voice, and video. We've seen some unbelievable changes in statistics. You may have read the most recent one that showed that PBX sales are down 16% year over year. You may have also seen that Cisco's share of the voice over IP market is now up to 63% and growing. We see situations such as the city of Dallas, which recently decided that they are going to run the entire city of Dallas on voice over IP, and they've ordered over 8,000 Cisco IP phones. So this technology change is not a matter of if it happens. The marketplace has determined that it will happen. And it's up to us as vendors to ensure that we're successful in this integration. Well, of course, with all the bandwidth coming along, the investment is rapidly moving towards high-speed core. The optical market promises, uh, despite its recent quarter of softening, uh, promises to be a, a very important place for all of us to be. Cisco is also focused very much on wireless. We've made a number of acquisitions in the wireless area, uh, including uh, the uh, Aeronet acquisition, which allows us to go 802.11b, giving 11 megabits per second wireless within the campus and higher speed up to the five gigabit uh, devices that we're expecting to come onto the market say that you will be able to have wireless high-speed data access that has traditionally been re reserved just for the connected wire world. A significant amount of research and development is on what we can do to make the network more intelligent, as we've already talked about content and uh, being application aware. Throughout all of this, there's need for higher speed switching capability and, that and the development of advanced hardware. All in all, Cisco is reinvesting 14.5% of its revenue in research and development. That amounts to over $3 billion this year in research and development and data communications alone. That is more money than the rest of the industry combined. And even that's not fast enough. So what we do is we use our market capitalization to make mergers and acquisitions a reality. So if we're to assume or if we're to come to a conclusion that there will be at least some lessons from the data world that apply to the telecoms world, uh, let me take some of the experience that we've been through in the past 10 years. The first is, is that the data world is dramatically based on standards. That's how the internet managed to explode so quickly. Innovation came from many different companies. No one owns the technology. Cisco does not own IP. Cisco writes software that ties all the standards together, but as evidenced by the number of startups who come into this industry, there's no question that, that the technology will continue to move quickly. The difference as well with open standards is that the vendor no longer has the power that he once had. If you reflect back in the data world to what happened with IBM, for example, the old IBM of mainframe, if you bought the mainframe, you also had to buy the disk drives, the software, the communication systems that went with it. But no more. Open standards mean that the marketplace drives the development. This reduced vendor power had an unexpected side effect. We started to even have service providers come to us as recently as three years ago and say, isn't it wonderful, I can build a data network. In one case, happened to be Bell Canada, my home country, said that they were building their data network with 17 different vendors. Well, the good news is that they could do that. 
the bad news is is that they increased they were finding that it increased their risk and the complexity of what they were trying to do so just as what happened in the enterprise market the vendors started to be driven towards end-to-end -to -end networks and that's why we continue to have to acquire technology so we can provide more of the pieces as this trend which is driven by customers continues but as the customers choose end-to-end -end, another phenomenon happens and that is that the niche vendors disappear and I've listed here the names of around uh, at least a dozen different companies that as, as recently as five years ago, you would have considered them to be a supplier. Crosscom, Wellfleet, Synoptics, Bay Network, Silent, Ford, 3Com, NSC, ACC, Ascend, Cascade, Packet Engines, Ypsilon, Newbridge, Livingston, UB Networks. Where are they today? So this consolidation in the vendor community appears to continue. Similarly, when you build something, in the early days of the data world, you would build an RFP on today's requirements. And in fact, one of the most memorable was that in the early days of this, of the data industry, equipment was purchased to connect local area networks. Well, the first step, of course, is connecting two networks and then perhaps other departments. Very few networks had 30 or 40 nodes. Well, what happened in the early days is that scalability became an issue and it was discovered that the software that was adequate for connecting just two or three networks no longer sufficed. And by 1993, the only networks in the world that had over 100 nodes or routers was, were Cisco networks. Similarly, some of the vendors were late with functionality like FDDI, SNA, the IBM Communications uh, uh, Technology. So the lesson that we've seen from the data world is that it's no longer enough just to develop your own. It's no longer enough to be vertically integrated. You have to spend very big money on research and development and also use uh, mergers and acquisitions for speed to market. So it's not a surprise that Cisco would stand up here and say, hey, the future is IP. But most now agree that there are some tremendous pressures in, on our industry. What happens if voice becomes free? One would argue that in some places where long distance is down to one cent or just over one cent a minute, that the costs of voice are, are changing dramatically. I had one president of a telco tell me, he says, do you know that it costs us a third of a cent to bill just for the billing alone for long distance? So what happens when the cost drops below one cent? It looks like the world of transport will no longer be an area where we can make profit. I think most people are accepting this at this point. But what happens next is an open packet telephony where the where voice becomes uh, data and data is transported by IP. We also see a world where the IT experience starts to overlap telephony to the point where we see applications that we're used to, such as call centers, such as voicemail, uh, become IP. So what that causes all of us to do is have what we call a race to relevancy, a race to understand the customer application to start to provide extra value where there could be margin. And of course, as evidenced by the stock market over the last year, where some major company stocks have dropped by as much as 75%, suddenly the losers can appear. So yes, it would be wonderful to know the future, and certainly uh, we've seen rapid changes here in Brazil and everywhere. But Cisco Systems is honored to have been here. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much for having us here.